And all of the websites and emails that I just mentioned, I will be putting in the chat box, so you will be able to reference them there as well. And speaking of the chat box, if you have questions to ask during this webinar, please use it by making sure that you're sending your questions to all panelists. So not only I, the host, will see them, but also our panelists will too. And today's webinar will be Business Plan Pivoting, presented by Vincent Williams, President and Chief Executive Officer of Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council. Welcome, Vincent. Thank you so much, Elisa. Uh, good morning, everyone out there in virtual land. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. As she mentioned, please place your questions in the chat box and I'll be sure to answer them. What I'd love to do for those of you that may have attended some of my workshops in the past in person is of course, keep everything very casual and fluid. And so uh, this is a new way for us to do things in this virtual setting. So if you will feel my energy, please feel free to, uh, again, ask any questions in the chat box. And if I don't get to it during the actual presentation, I'll be sure to answer it towards the end when we have a little question and answer period. So again, thank you for joining today's webinar, uh, Business Plan Pivoting. And as some of you may know that I um, work very well with a one-page template that provides a business plan uh, for any idea that an entrepreneur may have. And what I'd like to do now is to take that business plan and make some alterations to it so that everyone knows exactly how to pivot during these types of uh, economic disruptions. And so today's webinar and conversation is really gonna have some ideas and hopefully some great nuggets of information that you can use to pivot your particular business um, and your business plan, that product or service, uh, so that we can get through these types of uh, economic disruptions and changing times. So a little bit of information about myself. Uh, I have changed positions, I think, um, in the past year. And so prior to, I worked with the Illinois Small Business Development Center, where I was the director of that center in the Woodlawn area of Chicago. And now I am a president and CEO of the Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council. We are an organization that focuses on certifying minority businesses, Black, Latino, um, Hispanic, um, veteran, as well as um, Native American and Asian. Uh, and so if you are looking to be certified as a minority business, please reach out to us, chicagomsdc.org. Again, that email address or that website is www.chicagomsdc.org. So the first, first slide here again is how I tell you a little bit about myself, uh, why I feel compelled and uh, able to speak with you more about business plan pivoting. Um, I am a Chicago native uh, from the South Side. I am a true Sox fan, uh, but I actually will uh, attend Cubs game when, when they're winning, of course. Uh, I come from a family of entrepreneurs and business owners, and so throughout my entire life, I've always been in a setting or an entrepreneurial setting of, of course, having multiple streams of income come in. Um, with that, uh, I am uh, an actual certified business advisor with the state of Illinois, and um, I've dedicated myself and my career to empowering entrepreneurs uh, and the communities uh, through education and resources similar to this. I am a small business owner myself, uh, as well as a real estate investor. And so some of the trials and tribulations that I've experienced as an entrepreneur is why I feel qualified to be able to share some of the ideas and nuggets of information that I have for you. This also is a great testament as to why I advocate so much for many small uh, and minority-based businesses because I too have experiences, experienced those same type of challenges there. Um, some little accolades, I was featured as uh, one of the top 100 emerging leaders under the age of 50 by Diversity MBA Magazine. In addition to that, uh, I've gotten the um, Black Enterprise Man of Distinction Award and then recently was featured as the face of Chicago business. Um, so I appreciate that from uh, Tony Arts and some of the others that are out there. Okay, one of the first and really, really great resources that I think are is excellent for 
um, entrepreneurs and those that are looking to adjust their business plan is the Illinois Department of Commerce's uh, Starting Your Business in Illinois Handbook. This particular book is published every year. Uh, you can access it online, and there is also a hard copy that you can pick up. But I know with the pandemic that that has limited a lot of people, and so what I will do is make sure that this particular copy uh, is shared and access to, access to it is being shared, along with these slides that you will see today. Um, at the very end of the presentation, I will also provide my contact information, telephone number, and email address so that you can reach out uh, directly if there's uh, some, another question that you have that you want to talk, with offline, talk about offline or uh, if there's a way that I can help you and point you in the right direction with some of the other resources that are available out there. But this particular publication I think is phenomenal because it really does provide you with a, a well-rounded list of organizations, places to go to, um, uh, a full list of the resources available for those that are looking to start a business here, particularly uh, in the state of Illinois. Uh, it also has some checklist items, some financial institutions, and then just some great successes and shared stories from some of the entrepreneurs that have started their business um, here in Chicago and in the state. Okay. All right. I'd also like to mention some of the strategic partners that, of course, we work with here at the Chicago MSDC. Um, we here in, in our Chicago office have our Chicago MBDA which is the Minority Business Development Agency. And this particular agency is similar to some of the small business development centers that are out there, where we are focused on providing one-on-one -on -one advising and counseling services to minority businesses in particular. So you can reach out uh, to our website again, find that information and arrange for uh, free, um, no cost um, services and resources there. In addition to that, we also have the Illinois Technical Assistance Program that's housed here at the Chicago MSDC. And this is a particular program that focuses on providing technical assistance to minority entrepreneurs. Uh, you can access that again on our website, chicagomsdc.org, and find out more information about some programs and services that we offer in that arena for providing technical assistance. Of course, I'm a huge fan and uh, work very strategically with the Illinois SBDCs. There's about 34 of them, 35 of them, I believe now, and throughout the entire state of Illinois, and many of them are located in disinvested neighborhoods. Some of them are a part of um, community colleges and universities, and then some of them are just, again, within the community. Um, you can access this at illinoisbdc.gov, and you should also um, be able to click a link on our website to find more information about them no cost advising services, access to resources again from there. Located within many of those SBDCs, you're also gonna find international trade centers um, and procurement technology, uh, technical assistance centers that are really gonna focus and help you too uh, in providing some resources for your businesses. Um, another uh, program that we have here at the Chicago MSDC is our Discover Africa. So if your particular uh, product or service within your, uh, your company is looking to import or export um, with the country of Africa, please reach out to us and we can uh, arrange some counseling sessions for you to learn more about the processes there and then um, connect you with some others that are doing well in that capacity too. All right, so let's dive right in and get started. Uh, how I always start things off, and this is actually one of my business mantras that I listen to and look at each and every day. I actually have it on my bathroom mirror at home. It's called, He Who Fails to Plan is Planning to Fail. I did find out that Sir Winston Churchill was one of the people that actually really followed this and uh, put this mantra out there, but I think it probably originated before him. Essentially, what it says is if you fail to plan your business, how your business is going to work, who your customers are going to be, how you're going to um, earn revenue, how you're going to market it, then basically you're planning to fail. Uh, it's one of the great things that I think everyone should take heed to because it's almost like when you're looking to be, figure out what your day is going to be, be like. Am I going to have a really good day today? Let me um, plan it so that I can make sure that I don't fail. 
Okay. So what makes up a business plan? Uh, these are just some topics that uh, we're going to go through today. Uh, many of you that have created a business plan already will have this information. But at the very end of this presentation, again, and the presentation will be shared with you, uh, there is a sample one-page business plan template that you will be able to use as your guide guideline to setting up your own business plan. I personally think that it's excellent because, again, being an entrepreneur and coming up with many different new ideas, what you can do is take this particular template and use that for any of your ideas just to get it out there. And what you may uncover is that that particular idea is something that you don't want to pursue or go any further with, or it can be merged with another one of your previous ideas, and, uh, and therefore you're not doing double work or anything there. So I think it's a great way and a great tool and resource, if you will, um, for any entrepreneur uh, that's looking to, again, um, set up a plan so that they will not fail immediately with it. The topics that we're going to go through, of course, executive summary, your company, what that company is, the industry that you're identifying or that you're looking to work within, uh, what's your competitive advantage. Uh, these are all things, too, that you need to think about when you're interested in pivoting this plan. Uh, product, service, what it is that you're going to be offering, how you're going to market that particular product or service. What do your operations look like? Are you going to be located in, the, in your home? Are you going to have to have a warehouse? Are you going to co-locate? Can you work and coexist with some other businesses within a certain incubator or system there? What does your management team look like? What will that consist of? What are your financials? As you know, it takes money to make money. So if you know that you have that in place, then you know what you'll end up spending, and you have an idea of exactly how quickly you can start earning, um, earning revenue and essentially profits for that particular business. And then finally, uh, something that I know a lot of entrepreneurs don't like to think about, but that's that growth and then that exit strategy. And I think they go hand in hand. So as we go more and more through today's webinar and presentation, I will uncover some key questions and, uh, and answers that I uh, personally ask myself to make sure that that growth and exit strategy are included in my business plan. All right, let's start off with the business summary, okay? There's other known names that are out there that exist about a business summary. Some of them call it an executive summary. I think, again, this is just a one-liner that describes what your business is, right? We are a fast food industry. Uh, I am a, a nail salon that provides, you know, herbal care or so for all of my patrons. Whatever that your business or service is, you do want to come up with this one-liner that's going to describe your business. Because, again, think of the people that you meet. How would you best sell or tell someone about your particular business? And then what we're learning is right now that if you had an actual brick-and-mortar store which you relied on customers to come into the door, well, now that we're switching to this online platform, which has been a huge asset for a lot of those that are looking to pivot their business plan, then what does that look like as far as describing your business in this one-liner on some of the social media outlets uh, and, and Twitter, um, Instagram, and then some of the other ways that you end up marketing your business um, with the new changing ways there. And then lastly, what sets you and your business apart from your competitors? That's always a key summary of your business summary, like why should I buy from you? Why should someone uh, want to seek your services? What is one of the key identifiers that makes you different from some of the others that are out there? And another great thing about this is as we are pivoting and adjusting to this new way of doing business, what's that answer to that question of what's separating you apart is going to be one of those key identifiers. And it may help you, again, gain more market share, get more revenue, whatever your goal or your desire is with having your, your particular business pivot during these times. A great example that I use for a business summary is something that uh, I found online. I think many of you will probably be able to figure out who this company is already. But I started off with Blank is a centralized international company, which is the largest chain of fast food restaurants with more than 30,000 uh, restaurants and 100, located in 121 countries. 
countries worldwide. And I think everyone could probably figure that out right away, but the answer is McDonald's, right? That's their actual business summary. I wanted to mention that because it, since we all can identify with a large brand like that, thinking that this is their actual business summary, an example, that one liner that truly explains and separates them from all the others is one of the key differentiators that's gonna work for you and your company too. That's what leads us again to this business plan pivoting. Um, the fact that they can take this information, which is pretty generic, consolidate it down into this summary, this one-liner summary, and now share that across all outlets and people will still know exactly who they are. Okay, so now let's talk about your company. This is exactly who you are, what you do, your key identifier, uh, your logo. You know, as you, as you can access um, a lot of the resources online, uh, the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protections has a link where you can actually go in and check to see if your company's name has been taken already here uh, in the city of Chicago. Uh, and, then, and if not, then you can register that and make sure that, the, that you're locking that particular in. But one of the things that you really have to think about when creating this business plan, and particularly when you're pivoting your business, is what's the location of my company? Where is it going to be? Am I going to be online? Am I going to have a physical store? And then you have to think about what's this problem, the need, or the service that I'm fulfilling. We found that many companies and organizations today are um, disrupting the industry, right? So, for example, you've got Uber and Lyft that has disrupted the um, transportation and car carrier service business. I mean, really, for those particular companies that uh, focus and have um, the cab services, they've been able to disrupt that industry, industry, but they had to have some identifiers of exactly what that looked like, right? And so I mentioned two big companies here like Amazon and McDonald's because they're doing extremely well right now, but you also have to look at how they're adjusting and pivoting during, again, this economic time, this economic disruption and the bad economic times. So, for example, Amazon is doing so great that they are building more and more of their fulfillment facilities uh, throughout the country. I think here in Illinois alone, we have about five or six on the, on the near horizon that are coming up. And what that equates to is essentially jobs and other opportunities for businesses like ours to end up getting in front of a wider audience because Amazon centers can't fulfill um, whatever our, our services are. When you're thinking about the benefits, features, the name of your company, what your website's going to look like, always think about certain things or actions that are call to actions that a particular person can do or someone that you're looking to utilize your service. Um, I'll share with you one of the, the business ventures that I'm involved with is uh, a men's custom shoe line called Alexander Noel. So when my partner and I were looking to determine how we were going to create this website, what we instead of using alexandernoel.com, we wanted to make it a call to action. And so our website is www.shopalexandernoel.com. So you see that call to action there? It immediately triggers what we want you to do when you go to that website to pick out a, uh, a custom shoe, a men's shoe. And then this... I'll talk a little bit more uh, throughout the presentation on how we pivoted during these economic times um, to be inclusive of some other items that we know some of the customers have asked for, but also just some ways for you to identify ways that you can pivot with your company and your business plan there too. All right, the next one that we have here is the industry. What industry is your particular business, product, service located in? Which one are you? Finance, are you fast food, are you manufacturing, are you construction, are you technology? This little word cloud here kind of has a great assessment of some of the different ones there. But why this is critical is, for example, right now during these times when we're looking to pivot our business, you may end up actually changing industries, right? You're, you're, you're still under it, but you may end up adopting or adding in another type of product or service that's going to work for you 
during these particular times. And if that's the case, now you're getting out in front of more people, which means that you are going to have to adjust some of the marketing techniques that you're currently using and maybe even some of the way that you store and package and ship and even provide these particular products and services. So again, costs are associated with that. So that's why you want to look at where you're going to end up pivoting your business to because if it's going to cost you more to end up getting in front of that particular target market or target audience, then is that really what you want to do? Or can you streamline it and take it into a couple of segments so as you generate more revenue, then you can grow and get into that particular capacity there? Okay? Does that make sense? Perfect. Um, I'll go to, go to a question before I go on. I think uh, Bobby looks like it says, what resource is that that you can – used to see if your business name has been uh, taken. So you can actually go to the City of Chicago's um, business license website. And uh, I think, Elise, can you put that up on the, uh, in the chat there for them? And they can click on that, and they can check exactly where to go from there. Thank you. Okay. So what I did here was listed some of the, the, the top 19 actual industries that are um, – available and that a lot of um, business entrepreneurs end up putting, sure thing, Bobby, uh, putting their um, business under, starts at aerospace, transportation, agriculture, uh, food, pharmaceuticals, um, entertainment, energy, music, manufacturing, and again. And these go into some sub-industries, right? So like aerospace, where you can go into actual, you know, helicopters, drones, and some of the others that they have out there, the computer industry, technology, IT, content from there. So as you identify those subs, that will also help you clearly identify who your competitors are in the marketplace. It's very critical for you to understand, too, who your competitors are or who your, your allies are. Um, this could be someone that actually has a complement to your product or service that you're, that you're offering um, or can be a direct competitor um, for what you're doing, and you want to see what's going to be that clear differentiator for you. I always tell people one of the key things that separates me from uh, many of the other president and CEOs out there is that you get me, right? We're different. We may have the same leadership training or some of the same ideas and attend a lot of the same workshops, similar to some of the entrepreneurs that are attending this, but there's still that expertise that you provide. It could be your personal charm. It could be the way that you provide customer service. It can be a couple of different things that's going to separate you. But whatever that key differentiator is, you want to highlight that, and that's what will end up making sure that, or at least guarantee, that you can get to be uh, successful with what that product or service is that you're offering. There. All right. Now let's go to your mission. This is critical. you got to have a mission to what it is that you're doing. What is it that's motivating you to do this business, to have this product, to have this service? Uh, if it's a particular product or service that is in the not-for-profit realm, excellent. That's great. Just because your business is classified as a not-for-profit doesn't mean that you can't make a profit or run it like a business, right? Really what you want to do there is just take your profits and reinvest that into your business so you're not showing that, you know, it's there. But whatever that assistance is, that engagement that you're offering, this is what you want to know about it. What's incredible about this is a lot of times when a business is pivoting or changing during these times or even adapting new technology or new ways of operating efficiently, it's going to change the customer's world or who it is that they're reaching out to prime example of exactly what's happening right now. Remember, again, many stores that have brick and mortars are relying on people to come into the store, right, and buy that product or service. Well, if you don't have that foot traffic anymore, how, again, are you going to get this product and service out to the people? So now they've become drop-off delivery, curbside service where they can get the products out there. They're also advertising a lot more on some of the social media channels, uh, having people talk about what it is they're doing. And then they're even creating videos in different ways to show how to even use the product or service. Again, being innovative 
pivoting a little bit instead of relying so much on just that customer that's coming any coming into the store and now focusing on that virtual customer and getting it out there. Um, mission statements are, uh, by definition, incredibly important navigational tool when you're thinking about the future of your company. It says here, by identifying the purpose of your work, you can better understand the goals of your company um, and should be committed to accomplishing each of those goals. So when you have that mission in there, and you have that motivation, um, what's changing the customer's world, that's going to help you with pivoting, with understanding exactly how you're going to get this product or service out to them and, uh, and continue to learn and, and earn those profits. Next, let's switch over to uh, the next item on the list, which is identifying this ideal customer. Just as I had alluded to before, when you're pivoting your business plan, when you're looking at who is your ideal customer, who you serve, what exactly do they look like? Are they millennials? Are they within the? Uh, are they young parents? Are they within 20 to 35 age range? Are they 35 and up? Are they mature audience? Are they the senior audience? Let's say, for example, uh, I was a fitness expert, and if you saw this belly, you would definitely know I'm not a fitness expert. But let's say that that was your product or service, and now that you know we have to practice this social distance. We have to think of new ways that we can pivot this organization or pivot our services. So instead of physically being in a gym, since we can't go in the gyms, I think we can get back in there now, um, how can I pivot to now provide my services, my coaching, um, my personal training experience to this virtual customer? So now we, we're going to online. Well, again, if I really, in, at the time, only focused on those that came into the gym, that wanted to utilize this particular service in the healthcare facility, now that I'm online, I've got the option to tweak my particular um, exercises to include exercises for young adults, for children, for uh, aging parents, for the elderly. And it can just be adjusting it a little bit quickly. Again, that was a market that I didn't focus on before because they may not have particularly come into the, the, um, the establishment that I was located at. But now that I'm able to do everything virtually, why not diversify? And now I've got this whole wide range of what an ideal customer is for me, but also increasing exactly who I can get in front of. One of the things that uh, I always mention to you is that a lot of entrepreneurs uh, come to me as, of course, the president and CEO and ask, how do I get more access to capital? I need capital to start, start my business. Uh, I need capital to grow my business. I always say one of the questions that you should ask yourself instead of how do I access custom, uh, capital is how do I access customers, right? Because I can give you all the money in the world. You can advance and come up with this fancy website, fancy logo, fancy packaging, but if not a, one customer is walking through that door or not one customer is purchasing or clicking buy on that internet page, where are you at, right? So think about that. Keep that ideal in there, but then also focus on both of those too when you are pivoting or changing this business plan. I've identified who my customer is. How am I going to get in front of this customer? Again, what do they look like? And then Am I catering to exactly what it is that they're looking for? Make sense? All right, good. Next one is the customer problem. You always want to know what your problem, uh, what you're fixing. If you're going to be a disruptor, like we talked about a little bit earlier with the car sharing and the ride sharing industry. If there's a problem, what that problem is, is there a need, right? Once you, you may have an idea and become particularly convinced that everyone needs your version of the Big Mac or a hamburger. You know, how many hamburger joints are there out there, right? So think, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Are you going to have a sesame seed bun? Are you going to have something, you know, a plain bun? Um, are you using wheat bread? Are they vegan? You know, what types of things are, again, are you going to offer? when you're identifying what that problem is. 
that leads to what's the solution of the problem, and then, um, again, where you're going to be at with solving those problems. That's one of the best ways of addressing who your customer is and how you're going to end up working with them. I see another question here um, or from Bobby. It says, if your experience has been primarily with for-profit organizations, but you'd like to work with nonprofit organizations as an HR consultant, how do you go about seeking those opportunities? Um, yeah, this is actually a really good question. One of the things that you want to do, and you have to realize that a lot of nonprofit organizations uh, do operate on a very lean budget. So what you want to do is either volunteer your services initially so that people can see the value in what it is that you're offering and what your subject matter expertise is. And then from there, lead that into referral opportunities with other nonprofit um, clients for you to gain as clients and to work from there. Um, you know, for example, I'm very passionate about doing this here with helping other entrepreneurs to scale, to grow, to answer questions like this. I do it. I don't receive compensation for this. Uh, I do this in addition to, you know, running the business on a full-time scale. It's just really a way for me to share the knowledge that I have out there for you. So if you can start out that way, and then, of course, as you provide more great services, um, your brand will grow, and then you could end up uh, working with more nonprofits and then charging those fees for those services there. Okay? All right. Now let's go to competitors. This is extremely, extremely important when you're working with uh, different types of uh, industries for your particular business venture, and so you want to know who the heck your competitors are, right? Uh, who they are, what, who else is in the space, who do I need to compete with, how much money is there to, to be made in the industry? These types of uh, answers to these questions may even help you to decide if this is even the business venture that you want to go in. Again, as an entrepreneur, I get many ideas up here in this brain, and I'll just write them down and put them on a list or something there or add them to my vision board. And then as I do more due diligence about it and I uncover that, hey, it's going to cost me, you know, $200,000 to break into this industry here or to get this product actually created. I don't know if I want to make that investment or that major investment right now. So maybe I'll just put it to the side or I'll just completely scratch that idea. For example, I put some ideas of some industries that I know of that are very lucrative right now, the black hair care product industry. You know, I, can, I mean, I'm using the products every day, right? $2.5 billion to be made in that industry. If your product or service can, can pivot to take advantage or tap into that market, that's how much money you got to play around with or to get a portion of. Some people only want 2% of it. Some people want 10% of it. Uh, it's a very competitive industry, as you can imagine, um, very litigious community um, industry. So again, those are all factors that you want to look into. The fast food industry, if you know that you want to open a restaurant, look at how much money is to be made there. $256 billion. I think every time I look around, there's another burger joint that's opening up. There's a new one that I just noticed in my neighborhood. I think it's called Fast Freddy's or, or something like that. Uh, I haven't tried the burger yet, but I'm thinking, wow, who would want to compete? right next door to Wendy's, right next door to McDonald's, right next door to some of the others that are, to Culver's, hamburgers, and everything that's out there. But again, if they have a key differentiator, they know who their customer is, this is how they're going to end up tapping into it. But maybe they just told themselves, too, I only want 1% of that $256 billion, and I'll be okay. Those are the kind of questions that you ask yourself. And then... This is also key to looking at when you're looking to pivot your business, because if you can identify, again, uh, an indirect industry that you can focus on, then maybe you get, again, another set of revenue uh, possibilities for your particular product or service. And lastly, my due diligence uncovered the fitness industry is $100 billion, $100 billion. And that's why you, every time you turn around, you'll see a new company that's going to pop up. 
they just want a portion of that $100 billion. LA Fitness, Lifetime, Anytime Fitness, Planet Fitness, 24-Hour Fitness. Um, every time you turn around, there's something new that's going to end up popping into that. They just want a portion of that billion-dollar industry there. And then you want to uncover who these competitors are and why they are actual competitors. What's their differentiator? Again, you probably know why they're in the industry because they're looking to take advantage of those exact numbers uh, and gain that market share. But what else is it that is helping them to capture customers that are going to them and not coming to you or receiving your product or service? So those are some things to think about. And that's pretty critical when you want to identify how you're going to pivot, pivot in this marketplace, in this industry, how you're going to get this product or service or continue to get this out there. Think about what the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection are doing right now. Um, in the years past, these particular webinars or um, seminars were offered in person at City Hall. Uh, limited audience, right? A limited number of people that can come in to attend because of seating and things like that. And then you still have to get downtown to that location. Well, look what they've done now. They pivoted to offer these workshops now virtually. And what does that do? That literally has opened them up to having almost an international presence. What is that like? I'm not sure of the exact number who's on this, on this actual webinar today, but that's the hundreds, the thousands that can actually attend this now and share and gain more access to information. And I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good idea. So even going forward, once we get back to minimizing social distancing and getting back to maybe a classroom setting or having in-person um, seminars, I think there's still going to be the opportunity for the Department of, of the, the BACP to offer these um, virtually or even record those sessions so then you can go out there and see those a little bit later. Just again, some ideas for you on the actual pivoting and the opportunities there for you. Again, when we identified that competitive advantage, what is it that makes you stand out, right? What is it that you're doing different? Is your actual um, competitor a direct competitor or are they an indirect competitor? Key example for this is Chick-fil-A. Love me some Chick-fil-A, you guys. It's really a pretty good chicken sandwich. Um, but what have you seen? Companies like McDonald's who said, hey, they don't even offer burgers, but they are kicking our butts when it comes, comes to revenue as far as what people are looking now as an alternative to the hamburger, right? I think even some of their marketing pieces focuses on a cow, right, talking about eat more chicken. Pretty clever in my mind. Well, what did McDonald's immediately do? Identified a way to gain back a portion of that market share, and they've come up with their own southern fried chicken sandwich that's on a similar type of bun with just a pickle, right? Again, direct, indirect customer. How are you going to pivot? How are you going to make that in? I'm going to go to some questions here before I move on. Um, absolutely. The business plan template, because the question is, do you think this business plan setup can be used to start a nonprofit? Absolutely. And the reason for that is this template that you'll see at the very end that, again, will be shared with you all is for any type of business idea. It's almost a, a, a way for you to project manage exactly what you're looking to do. What the key differentiator is, if your business is going to be for-profit or non, not for-profit, is again, how you form your business. What do you really want to gain from it? Are you looking to provide and help? Is your mission, um, are, is, is, you, is it a mission-driven organization where you're looking to give back to the communities that you're serving? Um, then that's where the nonprofit world comes in. If it's for-profit, which I'm all about, right? We wanna sustain, we wanna be able to provide for our families. Um, and so that, is there a way that you can have two components of this product or service. So I, essentially I can have a for-profit business, but then have a nonprofit arm or entity that's located within the umbrella that I could still end up providing the mission-driven side of what we're doing there. 
And that's completely acceptable. We have a lot of companies out there that are doing that. Okay. Next question says, it seems like competitors would also be changing, especially in consulting. How can we best keep track of all the changes that our potential or existing competitors are doing? One of the things, that, and it's a great question. Thanks for asking that, Tamar. Um, one of the things that I try to do is I actually go to Google Words and I ask, I put my competitors' names in there so that I can constantly see any updates and new ideas of what's going out there. It's, it's Google Alerts, actually. And it shows me when they come up with a new idea and what they're doing. And so um, just in my downtime and as I'm going through my smartphone there, I'm able to see, hey, that's a pretty good idea, or how can I, how can I add this or atta attach that onto there? A lot of times, too, some businesses will have you join their mailing list so you can see what it is that's going on. I can guarantee you that there's probably some large corporations out there that have these think tanks that they work with so that they can pro provide all of these alternative scenarios on how to pivot and grow their business and what new markets that they should get into. It's one of the things that they're constantly looking at, how to evolve, how to change, how to remain relevant, right? You know, and when you think about a lot of the businesses, businesses today and what they spent, spend their, their finances on, do you really need a large scale restaurant or can you condense that down and it but your second and third as you see carry out and you'll see that happening around town too as businesses continue to scale and grow so think about that same thing if you're looking to get in front of that competitive market one of the things that's been happening a lot, too, with businesses pivoting now is they are getting in front of that indirect customer. And so with that, they're uncovering who their competitors are, what they've been doing to market to that particular com customer, and now they're gaining market share from that. So put that in. It looks like the question here is how do you determine what your direct and indirect competition is? Indirect is an alternative. Why are they not using you? Why did they not go to McDonald's? They wanted chicken. Why did they not do chicken? They wanted to go to White Castles or something like that. Again, indirect. Not direct. They're all in the fast food industry, but not a direct competitor to that hamburger. It's an indirect or an alternative source of where they can go. And that's what's determining your direct and indirect competition. All right. Next, we got management. You got to factor in management. How are you going to run your business? What will this look like? Are you going to do it full time? Are you doing it part time? Do you want to just be a silent partner and have someone else? Maybe it's a family member who's the, ex the actual expert, but you have the finances and the resources to fund this particular business. Maybe you are going to be the grit, the actual worker of the business, but you have a family, a family member or a friend that's funding this for you. They're the silent partner. You wanna know what that looks like. Again, with pivoting, you also wanna factor this in because it could, again, again, determine exactly how you're gonna get in front of these customers and what you're gonna end up doing with them, right? Who's gonna help? Who's gonna answer the phones? Who's gonna do the emails? Who's gonna handle your social media? I mean, a lot of people are not experts at this. And so again, by working this down or identifying this in a list, at least you know what your strengths are, you know what your weaknesses are, and then you can see how you can best take advantage of those or get help with those. Do you know anything about accounting? Can you balance your own books? Can you do payroll for everyone else? Do you have to hire an accountant, get a CPA for that? What about scheduling? There's software out there that helps you to identify, again, how you're going to take or best utilize and run this company. More importantly, this helps you too to identify, are you even qualified, right? I've got this huge entrepreneurial drive, this huge entrepreneurial spirit, but I don't know a darn thing about doing um, social media. So I know I'm gonna have to hire someone for that. I definitely know I'm not qualified for that. But I also 
know what it's going to take to get that in front of my direct and indirect customers. So I'm going to work with that social media expert to make sure that that message is going to be the message that I want to send out. And that's, again, where those pivoting ideas and everything comes in. And then I always share this with everyone. One of the hardest things in the world, of course, is being an entrepreneur and finding this ecosystem or group of those that's going to support you. When I first started out with some ideas in the real estate industry, I tried to get my parents involved in it and uh, my siblings and things like that. They were like, no, nah, man, we don't want anything to do with it, nothing there with it. So what do you do? You find another group of friends or another group of advisors, if you will, that believe in your idea, that will support you, that will come in and purchase either product or service from you there. Um, that's where this particular board of advisors comes in. And this is someone who's just going to be that cheerleader, who's going to be that shoulder to lean on. It could be these financial experts. It could be those that are attending these types of webinars. One of the things that I try to do when we're in person is I go around the room so that everyone can introduce themselves and, again, give that one-minute sales pitch or 30-second sales, sales pitch because you can identify there's some other ways for you to network. Maybe there's someone who's a website creator. Uh, there's another one who does some, some great things with social media. And again, as you identify what those weaknesses are, that's exactly where you can, or you have someone that you can go to where you may not have known that before. When you create this kind of ecosystem that you can depend on, then everyone continues to thrive with that one. So you want to keep that in mind too. All right, revenue potential. How are you going to make some money? Got to make, got to spend money to make money, but you also want to know once you identify what this industry is, how you're going to actually gain this revenue and what does that look like? If you know you want to go in. That service, what you're spending on this product or service. If I'm charging $25 for this particular can of uh, aerosol spray that's going to put hair back on my head, how much does it actually cost me to produce that? The packaging, the wording, how many ounces of it, what does that look like? And then what my profit margin. Key identifier, especially right now with learning the pivot, is my product or service recession proof? What we found out during this economic disruption is that a lot of businesses didn't factor this in. How could you, right? But we do know that there's other alternatives out there like business interruption insurance. And as you see with the PPP loans and some of the other uh, economic reliefs, opportunities that have been identified, presented, created during this time, just to kind of help everyone sustain. But I can tell you a lot of my favorite restaurants have closed. A lot of my colleagues have been laid off from their jobs because there just wasn't enough business that was coming in. But what is your product or service doing that saying, yes, I'm recession proof, or yes, I can pivot and still generate some revenue there. Um, I've seen some restaurants, again, that went directly to curbside service where they never did a lot of business in curbside service, but now they're able to at least sustain, but also get in front of a wider audience there that just never wanted to come into the restaurant or for some reason did not come into the restaurant at that time. I talked about what your costs are. You got to know these, know these numbers, and then how is this going to compare to you being in that marketplace? All of this information is really going to help you so you'll know exactly where your profits are, what your margins look like, and again, how you're going to pivot and change this product. Maybe there's a way for you to operate a little bit more efficiently now or gain more inventory and put that and stock that so that, for example, if you had a fulfillment house like Amazon that was normally handling your product or service for you, but when we started with the epidemic or with the pandemic and Amazon wasn't able to fulfill those orders, keep a stock of inventory at your home so you can personally fill those orders and make sure that there's no disruption in service for your clients or for your clients to receive that product or service. These are just some things that I think you should keep in mind when you're pivoting. Take that into consideration. And then even if this is a new business idea that you're thinking of, take that same scenario and apply it. I think, again, failing to plan, then plan to fail. you got to look at all scenarios and start thinking of that as you go forward with any type of new business program or business idea 
and that's going to help you to the next one. And then this leads to expansion opportunities or the exit strategy. I always say again, when you're planning, you want to know what that looks like for you. Am I going to put five years into this, two years into this, 10 years into this, or is someone like Apple, Amazon, one of my competitors going to come in and try and purchase it or buy it from me, acquire me, so I can go on to my next idea? And that's why I say you should always include this exit strategy with it. Plans, growth, scale. Do you want to franchise? Do you want to end up not just having a location here in Chicago, but having a location in Atlanta, New York, New Mexico, Florida, any of those there? What does that look like, right? And, and it doesn't mean that you have to immediately work on it today, but again, keep it in your mind when you're uh, planning because that's going to let you know exactly how you're going to do things. You don't want to purchase um, some type of software system that does not have the ability to scale and grow at the rate that you are going to scale and grow. It was a waste of money then. You want to identify those types of opportunities and take it there. Um, why should I be excited about these opportunities to scale or grow? Again, if you're a not-for-profit, you're getting in front of more people, helping more of that, that whatever your mission-driven um, desires are. And if you're a for-profit, of course, you're gaining more revenue, which is always really big. And then in that exit strategy, have that magic number. And this can be a crazy number that's out there. Um, I know that I will not sell my company for anything less than $10 million. Is your company ever even worth $10 million? Think about that there. Is there the possibility that it would ever generate that revenue or there'll be an ROI that's on there? Those are some of the things that you want to think of with that. I'm going to go over to some chat questions now and answer those. Um, how do you navigate seeking business assistance or guidance when in the planning stages for your business and protecting your idea? So one of the things that you want to do with that one, Patty Lynn, is you want to actually get a generic non-disclosure statement. And you can find this online, just put in non-disclosure. And whenever you talk about your business idea with a potential advisor or anyone there, have them sign that. And uh, it's literally just going to cover you in court in case that idea is going to be taken. But it's also one of the reasons why I say be protective, guard your idea, but also, you know, and you can kind of share the principles around it and what you're looking to do without actually giving it away. Now, if it's a true original idea, uh, widget, product, or service, you can immediately get that, protect it, trademark, so no one can end up taking that, you know, going forward or having that particular idea. Many companies start doing that right away. But again, all that costs money before you get there. And so you just kind of want to factor that in. Um, how would you define the difference between competitive advantage and key differentiator? So a competitive, they're similar in nature, um, but again, what's the competitive advantage of, uh, of going to a McDonald's? You've got a variety of actual products and services from a kid's menu all the way up to um, the dollar menu that they have now, which is affordable there. Uh, they're, they're trying to separate themselves from their competitors with their products or services. And a key differentiator for them would be those pretty good French fries, right? I think almost everyone loves McDonald's French fries. What's something that's separating you from everyone else that you know you can almost guarantee people are going to come to you for? Again, similar because they're both different than the competition, but what's the one thing that's separating you from the others? That's what Uber and Lyft did was basically they differentiated themselves in the ride share industry by being able to provide this service for those that just didn't want to deal with the, with the cab services anymore or be, you know, be in the comfort of a luxury car. I think they started with the black car services and some other things there. So keep those in mind. And then question here, how do you plan an exit strategy for a nonprofit? And this could be with you working with another nonprofit that you're similar to that will want to acquire your database. So say you have similar um, mission statements and you're very mission driven, they would acquire that. One of the things too with a nonprofit, you can just stop. I decided to get out of that particular business. 
I'm not offering it anymore. Think about child care services. Think about those that, you know, social services, those agencies that help others there. They just particularly stop. They no longer exist anymore. One of the things that's happening right now is it's very difficult for a lot of nonprofits to coexist because the fundraising pool has been minimized with the pandemic. They've been forced to close their doors, right? That's how you end up getting out of it. If you know that your product or service is excellent and your competition has still been trying to get, you know, either strategically um, work with you or even acquire you, that's where, again, that exit strategy comes in. Hey, I got a magic number. I'm looking to get out of this particular business, but I know that we've been kind of going after the same market for the same number of years. Here's what my number looks like. Are you interested in purchasing me? Acquiring all my assets and taking it off from there. Okay. All right. As we're closing up and coming to an end here, um, a few slides of, that I always like to share is, of course, the importance of completing this 2020 census, because that is really critical as to these types of resources that the BACP, the Chicago MSDC, SCORE, a lot of the other organizations that are out there to help entrepreneurs scale, grow, access to capital, access to customers. They get all of that information as from the results of the 2020 census, right? Particularly in the black and brown neighborhoods that have been so disinvested in over the past number of years. And you have to think these results too um, last for the next 10 years. So if you have not completed the census, please go to 2020census.gov, complete that census, make sure you're putting as much information in there. If you can't remember if you did it, no worries, do it again. And their actual system is able to determine if it was your zip code, your address or something like that, that had come in previously and they will consolidate and combine all that information so that we'll have this. But what this is gonna guarantee for us is if there's gonna be additional monies that are provided into the black and brown communities and the disinvested communities around the state, around the city, it's gonna determine the number of schools that are there, it's gonna determine road repairs, it's gonna determine if there should be other legislative um, or if they should increase the number of legislative representatives in that particular area. These are all of the types of resources that we look for. One of the things that we do here at the Chicago MSDC is advocate for these businesses, making sure that each and every one of them has a voice in some of these laws that are being communicated, right? We know that things are going up like, you know, the cost for minimum wage, but I will share a story with you. I have a client that has a donut business, uh, a donut company, and you have to think about a lot of times when people come in, let's say um, she charges $3.00 for one donut. And they're like, well, why would I come to you and buy this donut when I can go to Dunkin' Donuts and get one for a dollar? And you have to think this small business is still paying $15 an hour to that employee that's coming in. And you have an issue with a $3, probably darn good donut. It is a pretty good donut, but you're pay you, know, you have an issue with that, but they still have to pay that employee $15 an hour. So do the math as entrepreneurs, how many of those donuts do they have to sell just to cover that one hour for that employee? So think about the ramifications and what it is that happens when we as businesses don't like what's happening. But again, as entrepreneurs, we have to put on a different hat to uncover if we're truly looking at how this can be sustained, how we can continue to offer these products, these services, these resources, to the communities and keep employees coming in, remaining competitive, remaining relevant there, or even if we're charging the right price for that too. Here's that sample business plan that I talked about, company names, a summary, this is the template. On the side there, you'll see where you can actually put your logo, profile, industry, when you were founded. What's really great about this particular one page template, and again, this will be shared with you guys after the webinar is over, um, they will send this out to you, or you can reach out to me and I'll get you a copy of it. But what's great about it, it's just one page. You got it right there. So imagine if you're going in to pitch this to a group of investors, pitch it, 
to a financial institution, pitch it to your family, your friends, your board of advisors, anyone at all like that. They don't want to thumb through a 50-page, 100-page, a 300-page business plan. They want to look at almost a one, you know, a resume, if you will, the highlights of what makes your company ori- original, unique, why they should invest in it, why they should provide you with the resources, and even if they're going to participate or support your organization. So I think this is pretty good, and uh, again, this will end up being shared with you. So in closing, that is the business plan pivoting webinar. Here's my contact information, a telephone number for me, and my email address. Feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions. I'll be able to answer those for you. I'm going to go back over to the uh, chat question again, if you have uh, to the chat box. If you have any questions that you'd like for me to uh, answer for you, please um, put those in there. Uh, it looks like there's one last one here that I didn't get to is, oh, where can you go or, or can you go from a nonprofit to a for-profit? Absolutely, but you're going to want to determine and create a new entity for that. Um, as your business has started to scale and grow, you decided that you no longer want to be a nonprofit. So just create a separate entity, um, LLC, S Corp, C Corp, and then pivot that product, product and services over there. I think it's pretty critical to always have a type of nonprofit arm to your business because think about those funders or opportunities or organizations that do want to donate to your company, but they want the tax write-off. And so that's why I think it's good to have a nonprofit arm to your for-profit, no particular. Hi, Vince. It's Lisa. Thank you so, so much for the presentation. Um, only comments I've gotten are that this has been very helpful. This is so simple, great resource. So thank you so much. Um, really quickly, I will echo your words about the census. Uh, please, please go fill out, take out the census. It takes less than 10 minutes. And actually, um, the city of Chicago has launched a citywide challenge for residents to take the census. The last day for the challenge is today. And if you participate, it's actually a ward challenge. The ward with the greatest responses will get an ice cream social. So ice cream on a hot day, I mean, that's a pretty good incentive. On top of everything Vince mentioned about getting more funds into the community, um, organizations, workers, businesses, we're all in this together. So take the census, get counted. Um, so that was a low side push for the census as well. Um, if you guys do have any more questions, please send them in. We do have some time, obviously echoing the words of excellent points. Great presentation. Absolutely, Vincent. It's always a pleasure when you share your insight. Thank you. You're welcome, everyone. Take care. See you All soon. Right. Yep. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.